Centers in Eastern Europe, a large swath of the population lived in small villages called shtetls. And um, I gave a handout to everybody. It's got a glossary in the back, and hopefully a lot of the difficult words will be there. There are some song translations as well and some photos. But um, um, they lived they live in shells, small villages, and they pretty much isolated. They were, they were Jewish enclaves. And the language that they spoke was Yiddish. Now, Yiddish bears a close resemblance to certain German dialects. It has a lot of Hebrew words and phrases in it, and it's actually written with Hebrew letters, although it's transliterated for, you know, for people that don't read Hebrew, so for instance, your translations all are translated with uh, Roman letters. But um, um, when Yiddish was the spoken language, Hebrew was the sacred language that was reserved only for chanting in the synagogue. Yiddish was their common tongue, the mama lotion, it's called the mother tongue. And when almost the entire Yiddish population was wiped out, um, the entire culture disappeared. And Klezmer was a part of the culture. So Klezmer disappeared. Just disappeared. Um, however, before it disappeared, it had, uh, for a brief time, it had a parallel existence in this country. Uh, from about the 1880s to the 1920s, approximately two and a half million Jewish immigrants came to America. They settled mostly in New York, although in a lot of other urban centers, Philadelphia, they in Toronto, also in Canada, Chicago. And, um, and there, there was such a large number of immigrants that Klezmer was actually commercially viable in, during that time. And it was a commercially viable art form. Like all immigrants, you know, they brought their food and their religious traditions and their language and everything. So there were Yiddish radio stations and and Yiddish record companies and lots and lots of of, of pleasure music and Yiddish theater. But Klezmer disappeared in this country as well. And it disappeared because the children and the grandchildren of the immigrants that came um, assimilated. And like the children of immigrants probably universally, really wanted to distance themselves from the, from the sort of most blatant old world aspects of their parents and grandparents' generation. So we can think of the old world as Europe and the new world is America. And they really wanted to distance themselves. And Klezmer was absolutely old world, no question about it. So it was, um, it was by the 1950s, it was just about gone. And by the 1960s, it was, it was almost completely gone. I mean, to, to how you would, children who were being bar mitzvahed in this country in the 1960s would never dream of having pleasant music at their wedding or bar mitzvah or something. It was, Totally unthinkable. So, um, so it disappeared. However, about 20 years ago, uh, a Klezmer revival began. And this renewed interest coincided with a number of things. It coincided with um, multicultural curriculums that are just sort of proliferated around, with globalization, with world, with interest in world music. And it also coincided with a generation of baby boomers trying to look and find out about their own roots. And Klesner is really part of their heritage. And so people began to look back. And what they discovered was that far from being an embarrassment, this music was absolutely wonderful. And so a huge revival has sprung up. And, um, and it continues to this day. And when we talk about a Klesner revival, the word revival actually is can be used literally because we're talking about the Holocaust. I mean, you can't think about Klezmer without thinking about the Holocaust. The two are totally interconnected. So revival is the right word, brought back to life. Now, I'll just make one more point about, um, about all of this before we start actually playing. And that is that there's no way to recreate this music exactly as it was heard in Eastern Europe, or for that matter, exactly as it was heard in this country in the 20s and 30s. 
Um, even if I wanted to, I couldn't. My clarinet is a modern clarinet. Um, if you look at, on your handout, there's the first picture, there's a picture of the drum. It's called a poik. And it's a wonderful Yiddish word, a poik. And it's a, it's a bass drum with a cymbal attached on top and it had straps so they could wear it when they would march and travel. And, um, and so they didn't have a drum set. And they certainly didn't have a piano. They maybe had a concertina or something of that sort, or an accordion. And so um, the music sounded very different. So even if I brought just my combo, for instance, instead of Russia, it wouldn't sound the same. And authenticity, you know, authenticity is a very complicated word and a very complicated idea. What's what's authentic? What's not? But um, so. So the other, but more importantly than the actual instruments in terms of authenticity, is the fact that we're all products of our time. And musicians and artists play, you know, and people think, whether you're a musician or not, according to what's in your senses. Musicians have music in their ear. We can't help having had rock music in our ear for the last 30 years. It's just there. And it inevitably is going to come out when you play, whether you want it to or not. It's, 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 it's part of our being and, um, and the way we think and the way we are. And so, so um, like I said, there isn't any way that I could recreate the music exactly. I didn't try. What I thought instead was um, to make the music come alive as much as possible. And, and that way, you would have a sense of what Klezmer is really all about. You would really get the sense of the spirit of the music. And that's why I brought the symphony orchestra. You know, Klezmer revivalists today fuse their Klezmer with all kinds of styles. They fuse it with rock and with avant garde jazz and with reggae and rap and everything you can imagine. And um, the symphony orchestra is my number. So when I was looking to expand and grow, um, I decided to do it with the symphony. So that's why the symphony orchestra is here today. And um, so again, it wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to be radical. I was just trying to make the experience as uh, vibrant and true to its spirit as much as I could. Um, and because, you know, really what we're talking about is what, what was lost in the Holocaust and what survived. And when we talk about what survives, anything that survives, by definition, creates a new and grows. And that's what Klesner is doing. So you know this expression, the medium is the message. Well, the medium is part of today's message. Um, so let's go back to the old world for a second and talk about Klesner music. Um, the word, now we use the word klezmer to describe a style of music. In the old world, in Eastern Europe, before the Holocaust, it was only used to refer to a person who played the music. So klezmer meant musician, and the suffix I am, klezmorum, is the Hebrew suffix I am makes something klezmorum, means several musicians, more than one musician. They never ever used it to refer to the music itself, like we do today. The word klezmer comes from two Hebrew words. Kale, which means vessel, like a goblet or something that holds something else. And zimmer, which means song in Hebrew. So kale zimmer, kale zimmer, kale zimmer. It was this Yiddish contraction of these two Hebrew words. And kale means vessel, zimmer means song. So put together, it means vessel of song. And when you think about it, it's really a wonderful um, uh, illustration or, or example of what shell society, Yiddish society, thought of their musicians. They saw them as vessels. You know, a vessel means it's not about the it's not about the the musician. You're just a channel for the inspiration. The inspiration comes from on high, from the divine, from some better part of the human self, whatever you think. 
and it comes through the vessel and comes out through the instrument to be shared with others. And it's a very, really a very enlightened and a, a, a mystical view of, of how that society thought of their musician. And I think it's, I think it's a wonderful, um, you know, words and names and labels can teach us a great deal when we're looking at history. And I think this teaches us something about how they thought about their musician. However, despite this very enlightened view of the musician, the actual Klesmoron were very poor. They were uh, very, very, um, uh, they weren't regarded very highly. They were, they were mistrusted to some degree. They were, uh, they had to travel to make a living. So from village to town, they could travel. A lot like freelance musicians do today. And, um, uh, so because of that, you know, there was some, they were viewed with some skepticism about, you know, money and they could, you know, cheat you with, you know, come into town and leave and give you, take money for a wedding and whatever. Um, they, there's a wonderful song called Oi Mama, uh, old Yishir song, Oi Mama, bin ich verliebt, oh Mama, I'm so in love. And the mother says, who are you in love with? And she says, I'm in love with a klezma. I'm in love with a musician. And that's the tension in the song. Because we definitely want their daughter to marry a musician. Um, so their social status is practically at the bottom of the already marginalized Jewish society. And uh, part of this was because of their itinerant status. And part of this also was because they had a fairly close association with the Romani people, with gypsies. And I don't like to use that word because there's a lot of negative stereotypes associated with the word gypsy. But the Romani people were, were also itinerant. They traveled all the time in families and in tribes. And they were also uh, highly respected for their musicianship. There, if you ever listen to, to gypsy music, even today, it's incredible. It's a very distinctive style. And, um, and so there was a close musical connection between the Klesmoran and the Romney. And the gypsies were even more mistrusted than the Klesmoran, even Jews almost. And certainly they suffered in the Holocaust as well. Um, so probably because of this common outsider status, that was another, between the Klesmoran and the gypsies, that was probably another reason why the Klesmoran were pretty long in terms of in shadow life. Um, because the Klesmoran traveled, their music was influenced by whatever region they were in. So Klezmer from Hungary sounds very different than Klezmer from Ukraine, for instance. Um, Yiddish is the same way. Yiddish is a very fluid language. You know, um, even, to, even to this day, you know, Yiddish speakers, few that there are, in New York have, have expressions, very New York expressions, that they didn't have when they here, because it adapts. Every, you know, the music adapts, the people adapts, everything adapted itself. They were people in the diaspora to adapt. Uh, one final comment about old world Klesmora before we play. Many of them came from family dynasties, I sort of use that word loosely, family dynasties of musicians, um, where the musical profession was passed down from one generation to the next. And very often in Yiddish, the surname, the last name, refers to the profession. So if you ever hear the name Musiker, that was actually a very common name in this country for a while. Obviously they were musicians. Um, fiddler, like a fiddler was a famous conductor, fiddler. Um, this applies also to non-musical names as well. The, the name Schneider is a very common name, meant Taylor. And there's a um, uh, newscaster on MSNBC, David Schuster. So somewhere in Eastern Europe, in his background, there was a shoemaker somewhere along the line. So let's hear what this music sounds like. We're going to start, Brian and I are going to start with an old folk tune called Aceous Hyle.
Now, the Mohler scale that this tune was based on is a very Hebraic sounding succession of notes. And um, these modes or scales also relate to the cantorial modes that the, that the cantor sings or chants in the synagogue. And um, it's important to remember, though, that this music is secular music. This is music from wedding dances and lullabies and theater and secular, non-religious music. It may have some mystical elements, but it's secular music, compared to sin, which is liturgical, which is sacred. Synagogue music was in Hebrew. Klezmer uh, music is in Yiddish. And, um, And certain inflections also make this sound Jewish. So I can play a lot of bends. Also, um, something called a kreft, which is like a, it's like a sound that gets stuck in your throat. Yiddish has that too. There's a word in Yiddish called fragenigen. And you don't say fragenigen, you say fragenigen. It's like it's in there. And the music is the same way. Um, there's also this kind of sound, which clarinetists love to play. And clarinetists give it a very technical term. We call it nyap yaps. <laughs> and all of these inflections are also heard by the cantor in the synagogue when chanting is done. And so there's these musical stylistic overlaps, even though they're separate entities. Now, our next selection is a, also a folk song. And this song, and I'll give the lyrics to you, this song, to me, reflects a great deal about Yiddish attitudes. Um, one of the things that I love about Yiddish music is that there's almost a complete absence of sentimentality in it. You know, life is good sometimes, and sometimes life is hard, but it's all part of life, and you just have to accept it all. You know, a wedding is a joyous occasion. What do you do? You break a glass to symbolize the sharp edges of the road, most likely. You know, sunrise, sunset. I mean, it's all, it's all part of life. And, um, and so this song, to me, reflects reflects this sort of lavish, philosophical outlook on life. Uh, this is called To the Fair. And it's not, uh, they don't mean fair like carnival fair. It means like a market, an open-air market. So, Schreitz it mir mit gichet mit gichet fit. Quick steps, I went to the fair to buy a horse. Fair means a horse. And um, my purse jingled with coins. Uh, a little zingeth here, and I sang a little song. The city was still a long way off, and I came to an inn. I said, Innkeeper, Dalabos, give me a drink, give me a glazel. And nach a glazel, nach a glazel, another drink, and another drink, another glass, and another glass. Now, eh, who wants to go to the city? Who wants to go to the fair? Who needs a horse? No horse, no money. Now it's surus, which means worry. Surus makes me skip and sing. <laughs> Der Zeit, 
rich man, give a glazel, give a glazel me. Läuft der Herz allein vorbei, 
Wartet dort auf und schreckt. Hört mir, hört mir, schreit der Holz. Jeder, jeder schützt mir euch. Juma, hört zu näher rein, wie hätt er mir sein. Jeder, jeder schreut, du war Herz alle allein, wie hätt wir für sein? starts in the 30s and goes through the bombing of Dresden, which he actually survived. But he was German, and it was, it was uh, a complete surprise as gradually, you know, I mean, eventually people saw the writing on the wall, but initially it was a big surprise. So if you're interested in that, it's Victor Comfort Diaries. Um, one other little anecdote about all this, uh, you know, in upstate New York where I live, uh, I play a lot of his concerts and I play at Jewish community centers and synagogues and things like this. And I became friendly with the person who would come to my programs, even though he really hated klezmer music. But he would come just to sort of be supportive or whatever. And he had grown up in Germany. His 
uh, he was a survivor. His, he and his family fled, and they fled to Spain, and then eventually to London, and then eventually to America. And um, he came up to me one time after a program, and he said, he said, do you know what we call, when I was growing up, do you know what we call the Yiddish language? And I said, no. And he sort of chuckled, and he said, we called it murdered German, which was so unsettling uh, for a lot of reasons to me. I mean, partly that after all this time, all these years, and everything that happened, that he still had this very, um, you know, negative view of Yiddish and Yiddish culture and and the Yiddish language, and that it was still beneath him very much so. And also the irony of calling it murdered German when you know it was really the other way around. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to another another selection here. And I think doing children's programming is really good. Children weren't spared in the Holocaust, and um, I think. It makes the whole thing that we're trying to portray here a little less abstract. You know, it's like seeing the exhibit of the shoes from the customer. It's um, you really, you know, these are these are real people with real children and real stories and real lives. Um, this is a an old Yiddish folk tale that is set to music. It'll be done in English, and the Yiddish is called. Der Wissendik Evredne, the wisest of the wise rabbi. And the alternate title is Things Could Always Be Worse. <laughs> and I like to call this song A Jewish Peter and the Wolf. <laughs>
chicken it clucks. My wife, she screams. The kids, they fight. I can't stand it anymore. And the rabbi said, Herschel, go home. With the horse in the barn, with the cow in the field, with the chicken in the yard. So the man walked slowly home and did as he was told. A week later, he went back to his rabbi and said, Rabbi, my house is so quiet now. I sleep like a baby. How can I ever thank you? <laughs> survival doesn't depend on marriage and staying together uh, the way it did back then. And because their society, if this relationship a name, we can deduce the fact that it was a very important relationship. There are many songs about the Mahatan. It was a relationship that was probably fraught with some degree of tension. You know, two strong women, the mother of the bride, the mother of the groom. There was a lot of tension between the, the bride and very often and her mother-in-law. So anyway, so that's why this is exciting. And when a society names something, you can figure that it's probably important. You know, in our culture, the word teenager didn't come into existence <clears throat> until the 1950s when all of a sudden there was a whole lot of people who were between the ages of 13 and 8, 19, who had money to spend. They could be marketed to. They were important, and it was because there was the baby boomer generation, so there were a lot of them. They had, they had leisure time and leisure money. 
So our society gives them a name, a teenager. There was no name, that word didn't exist before that. So when you're thinking about history, you can sort of think about all these different things. So we're going to play, here in the Mokotone, it's very processional, you can picture the families coming to the wedding, to the chutzpah, to the town, to the village for the wedding.
that I would like to portray because it presents to you a slice of Jewish life that we haven't exactly covered yet. Uh, in the summer, there was a mystical spiritual movement that began in Poland, and uh, it was the aim was to make prayer and devotion very personal. There was a feeling that it had sort of become very impersonal. By the 1800s, cantors were trained as opera singers and became very theatrical. So they wanted to make it every, they wanted every person to feel a connection with the divine. And this is called the Hasidic movement. Chesed in Hebrew means pious. So they gave themselves the same Hasidic. Um, it was started by a man who is known as the Baal Shem Tov, which means master of the good name or master of God's name. And the Baal Shem Tov has reached almost legendary status in, in Hasidic culture and the whole Jewish mystical movement uh, at this time. By all accounts, he was a, truly a mystic and truly a seer. He, like the Buddha, he went out, the story goes, went out to the woods and he meditated for who knows how long and he communed with nature and he had visions and he came back um, a mystic and he trained uh, by his followers who then had followers who then had followers. So all the Hasidic sects can uh, trace their lineage ultimately back to the Baal Shem. In addition to strict uh, observance of Jewish law, dietary restrictions and all sorts of other restrictions, so they're very observant, the primary teaching was to connect with the divine. And one of the most important ways to connect with the divine was through music and through being joyful. That when you're joyful, when you're happy, you're actually connected with some higher power. The yoga tradition has the same thing. They believe in the chakra system, and when your crown chakra opens, opens with inspiration and it closes with fear. And when your crown chakra is open, you're, you're in spirit, you're inspired. You know that feeling when you listen to like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or something and you get the goosebumps down your back or whatever does it. Yeah, you know, everybody's different. Whatever does it for each individual person. But that feeling is an incredible feeling. And Really what it means is that you're inspired in spirit. So uh, sometimes I would tell my, my students, if they were nervous about taking a test or something, I would say, you know, think of something that inspires you. Because you can't feel fear and inspiration at the same time. And somehow the Hasidim had this figured out. So they really have a huge emphasis on music, on dancing, on singing. And there's a whole body of music that has come through the Hasidic tradition. It's called Nigun. What is a song or a chant? Uh, Nigunim. Again, that plural means you know, a whole body of these Nigun. And um, the main thing about Nigunim is that they don't have words. And they don't have words because the feeling was that words keep you earthbound. And the whole aim is transcendence, is to transcend the here and now. So instead of words, they have lie, 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 or yai, yai, yai. And you hear it over and over and over again. And you go to and repeat it over and over and over and over again, like a mantra. And eventually, you sort of reach this kind of hypnotic state, hopefully. So we're going to do a new one. This is not a, an old new one. This is actually a contemporary new one. Um, and we'll, in true Hasidic fashion, I'd like us all to sing together. Okay, so we'll all sing. You don't need to know any words. We're not going to do that many repetitions. Not reach transcendence this afternoon, but you never know.
any thoughts, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Was that leadership? Was it forward or um, the music, well, you know, I don't exactly know. I know there's, li there's two main ones, there's Litvak and Luciana. And I really don't know which one I've learned, but I couldn't tell you. I think it's, I don't know. What happened was with the, with the dialects is that Yiddish is such a fluid language that when, uh, after the war, survivors came here, and whatever it is because they were came here, there was an institute called Yibo. Uh, to try and codify the language that had not said before. And so they, they standardized it. This is what they standardized Yiddish. And I don't know which one they so I should know that I don't. <laughs> Any other questions? When you say clusters disappeared, how did they come back? Where did they find the music? I'm going to get to that when we talk about the revival. But what happened was there were. Um, uh, now, there was some sheet music here in this country, although mainly it was passed on orally, you know, the tradition is more tradition. But there were there were folios floating around. There were a few country musicians who had had a career in this country in the 20s and 30s who were still alive in you know the the Paris of the name of the Berlin. And these were alive. So some of these uh, people, you know, for the last 10 15 years found them and have them play to take for us and do this whole thing. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, a number of people went over to the Soviet Union and also discovered a few musicians. There's a documentary called The Last Living Cousin, I think it's called, it's very popular. And there was also some sheets as well, and some older, old scratch recordings. So a lot of it's been transcribed now. You know, so much has been transcribed from the old recordings and old, um, you know, the field work that there's a lot of principles in the world. Anything else? Yeah. What part of Europe did the Hasidic come from? They came from Poland. Oh, Poland. Poland. Yeah. Were they the gypsies? No, they were. Um, no, they were. They were very poor. The Hasidic. They were. They were shell Jews, and they. Um, they this Dalshan Tov just developed a following and gradually it sort of spread. And each of the Dalshan Tov's followers had sort of his own sect, the Satmar sect, and there's a Labancha sect, and there's a Kutan. And, um, you know, like everything that gets institutionalized over time, it's possible for some of the essence to sort of get sublimated in the institutionalization you know, of, the, of the religion, of the spiritual practice. But as essence, it was a very spiritual, very spiritual movement. And and you know, you're going to watch some of the song, and dancing, you're going to watch the same way. The dancing is, I mean, it's only men that dance with each other, or women dance with each other, but, um, but the dancing is pretty wild. Um, now, our next song is going to be the last little bit of Yiddish that you're going to hear today. We have an instrumental after that. Um, it's worth noting that the disappearance of present and the disappearance of Yiddish as a spoken language uh, are interconnected. There were not enough survivors after the war to um, uh, Europe, obviously, to sustain the language. And the Yiddish speakers that came here assimilated, and there, the Roth generation of Yiddish wasn't spoken in the home, and so there was no more Yiddish there. Um, when the state of Israel was established, it was, after the war, it was there was a lot of discussion as to whether the language should be Yiddish or should it be Hebrew. It was eventually decided that it should be Hebrew. The reason was there was a feeling that Israel was to be sort of the homeland of Jews everywhere, not just the Ashkenazi Jews, not just the Eastern European Jews. Basically, they were just the survivors of the Holocaust. And they, want, they felt Hebrew was more universal that way. There was also a feeling that, that Israel was really going to present a positive, um, strong image of Jews to the world. And there was a little bit of a feeling that Jewish was very old. For and so that was another reason why they, they chose Hebrew. Um, <coughs> The, um, there are a few Yiddish clubs around. I actually belong to one. I just kind of you know, get together and speak and read. 
Um, and there are a few people who have been spoken at home and still speak it. But basically, also, also a number of Hasidic sects actually have Yiddish as their, as their uh, spoken language in the home. And they have so many children that actually their balance of Yiddish is actually growing. But for the most part, Yiddish is not, you know, it's not a living language. It just isn't anymore. And that, and that part of it is very sad. People that speak it now, you know, that are trying to learn it now, do so for the sake of history, for the sake of intellectual curiosity, or you know, for literature, or what have you. But it's not a common tongue. We're going to leave the old world with history, and we're going to go to the new world. And um, Yiddish theater thrived, Yiddish music thrived in the early part of the century. Um, and as American Jews became better off economically, one of the uh, uh, signs that they had really joined the middle class was that they were able to afford summer vacations. And the vast majority of Jews, not the vast majority, but a lot of Jews lived in New York and the Catskill region in upstate New York, about two hours from New York City, became known as the Borscht Belt. Hotels that catered to sort of, you know, Jews who now had more money to spend a little bit more leisure time, and places you may, whose names may sound familiar, they may not, I don't know, but the Concord, Richards, and Grossinger's, and all of these hotels, and these hotels really thrived. Um, so we're going to do a staple from the Borscht Belt, and it's called Romania. And the lyrics of Romania talk about, describe the memory of the homeland, the memory of the homeland. You have to remember this is now Americanized Jews. So in, the, in their memory, in the, in the old country, everything was wonderful. The food was delicious, and the, and the, you know, the wine flowed freely, and life was an archive, and life was a pleasure. Um, this song was done so many times that it became something of a cliche, basically. If you ever watch the movie um, with Billy Crystal and Saturday Night, there's a version in it, and there's a shot version of Saturday Night. You can hear it. It, it. it became a caricature of itself, really. Um, and actually, almost all of the present music became a caricature of itself, itself by the 1960s. And, and, it was, and I mean, it was inevitable, but it was sad at the same time. Uh, so when we do Romania, though, I don't, I don't want it to sound like a, like a grotesque caricature. I think the song has just amazing vitality and um, and just a spirit to it that's wonderful. So we're going to do Romania for you now. And I need to say one other thing. This orchestration was done by our very own Brian Wilson. This was done a couple of years ago, about 10 years ago. And uh, so I think it's a, it's a funny, crazy, archetypal pleasure song. In the late 50s and early 60s, there was a Jewish comedian, um, kind of social commentary person uh, named Lenny Bruce. He's sort of like, um, well, our modern day John Stewart, but really much more. And Lenny Bruce always said, whether you're Jewish or not, if you live in New York City, you're Jewish. <laughs> the same thing with this. Whether you're Jewish or not, if you have one of these caps, <laughs> you're automatically Jewish. <laughs> and you don't have to be circumcised. <laughs> Did I say that here? I didn't know. <laughs> Romania, 
Given a moil a land as a fine. Or to voyen is a fargenigan. Was those hearts to dear, those coos to kriegen? Ah, mamelegale.
construct, and it was very conscious, and it was very deliberate. They're saying, we're going to Eastern Europe, we're going to unearth this music of Eastern Europe, we're going to call it, you know, what that was used back then, and we're bringing it back to life after the Holocaust. In this country, they just called it playing Jewish. My father is a planet player, played in the hotels, and all those years, and he said he never heard the word Cosmos. They would play Cha Cha, they'd play Merengue, they'd play a, you know, a Fox track, and then they'd play Jewish, and that's what it was called. <laughs> so, so the word Klezmer is a revivalist term, and it's the exact reverse. Now we don't call the musician a Klezmer, we call the music Klezmer music. And as I said before, Klezmer music fused their style, fused their, Klezmer revivalists now fuse their style with many, many, many different styles. And, um, there's a give and take. There was a give and take in this country between Klezmer and Tim Pan Alley and jazz. There was a give and take in Europe between the Gypsies and the Klezmer. There's a give and take now between rock and roll and the current Klezmer. So we're going to end our program with um, a Klezmer fusion, but it is not as contemporary as you might hear now. By the way, for those of the younger people, if you're interested, you can go online and you can search out you know, lots of different contemporary Klezmer bands. I mean, some of them are really interesting. Some of it's not so great, but some of it's really, it's all interesting. It's all interesting, and you should, you should really check it out. I think you probably like it. Um, we're going to do, a t uh, we're going to end in the 1940s with um, The Angels Sing. It was a big hit by the Benny Goodman band. It was originally a Klezmer framework called the Steeler Bulldog, the Quiet Bulldog. Benny Goodman had a big hit with it. Ziggy Elman took a Klezmer solo in the middle of it, and the rest of it was all swing. And we're going to take that as our inspiration and go back and forth between the swing and the Klezmer and the swing and the Klezmer. And Rick, it, you'll know the difference when you hear the Klezmer beat and the, and the reincarnation of Gene Krupa. Of Brian Wilson, who did this for us. It's a recent piece. And um, before we play it, I need to thank a number of people, all the musicians, all the musicians.
Thank you.